perspectives of regional organizations and UN agencies, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. Uh, Talo Falava again, and welcome to the Pacific Climate Change Center. And it is a pleasure to host you here today uh, for the Pacific webinar on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Sixth Assessment Report, Working Group Three. Um, a special welcome to all of you who are joining us online, our member countries, um, academia, colleagues, and our partners. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. And even though it is virtual, uh, it is good to see you all virtually from around and beyond the Pacific. Um, without further ado, uh, and as usual in our Pacific way, may I invite Mr. Sione Furibai, the coordinator for the FRDB here at SPREP, to please bless our program today. Thank you, Sion. Thank you very much. Uh, if we could bow our heads in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we again come together as a regional family and under your guidance, ask for your blessing, as well as your guidance in steering us and showing us a way forward as we progress the work that we continue to thrive and look forward to, to make sure that the survival of our people is our number one priority. We also understand, Lord, that you have always been guiding us throughout our work and that the many challenges we have faced since the COVID pandemic has been upon us, that you have always given us a light and a tunnel to which our vision is maintained and our drive goes forward. We ask these things from you to make sure that we all come together in strength as well as in unity to drive forward the things that we need to persevere in our work and make sure that we leave no one behind in our determination to work towards the better goal. And in these things, we ask in the name of your son, our Lord, King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For the prayer and for blessing the program today. Uh, I will now call on the uh, Director General of SPREP uh, and also the champion of the IPCC implementation from SPREP, Mr. Sefanaya Nawandra, uh, for your welcoming remarks. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ofa, and the team from uh, Climate Change, including the Pacific Climate Change Center. The Honorable Minister for Natural Resources and uh, Environment, Toyo Lesulusulu, Cedric Susta, uh, country representatives, members of the CROP and uh, UN family of uh, colleagues and partners, uh, members of uh, partner organizations, members of our expert panel who will be leading us in the dialogue uh, this afternoon. Our partners from the Australian National University helping us to deliver this uh, webinar. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the Pacific Climate Change Webinar on the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report, Working Group Three on Mitigation of Climate Change. To start, I'd like to acknowledge the partnerships, strong partnerships that exist between our host government, Samoa, the government of Japan, and the government of New Zealand that has allowed us to, first of all, establish the Pacific Climate Change Center and uh, to fund the manning of the center in its initial years. We also thank uh, the Irish IS Fund and other partners who are helping us to make the dream of the Pacific Climate Change Center a reality for all of us here at SPREP and uh, all of you in the region who have been strong supporters of this idea and the establishment of the PCCC. I'm honored with the new title I was just given in the introduction that I'm uh, uh, a champion of the PCC. Um, even though I wasn't uh, asked, I'm very glad to fill that role because I, I know that this uh, center is very important to all of us and needs to be something that we 
make effective to meet the needs of our region. On the 4th of April uh, this year, the IPCC approved and released their new Working Group 3 report on the mitigation of climate change. This uh, report provides an updated global assessment of our progress in meeting our emission targets, particularly in relation to the Paris Agreement goal to limit global warming to 1.45 degrees Celsius and well below the two degree Celsius target. It looks at regional and sectoral emission sources and considers the time and opportunities for us to act. The report also considers whether national commitments and policies are strong and transformational enough to achieve long-term emission targets and how these can be strengthened. The IPCC reports are the world's most authoritative sources of climate science, approved by 195 countries. It is one of the dreams for this center to enable more scientists from the Pacific to be part of this assessment process that we need to carry out globally every so often. The message from climate scientists in the IPCC report confirms the critical need for governments to take urgent concerted action to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit goal. Limiting global warming, global warming will require major transformations in the energy sector. A substantial reduction in fossil fuel use improved energy efficiency and use of alternative fuels is necessary. Stringent mitigation measures in line with the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal should have sustained impact to limit anthropogenic climate change. There would be discernible effects on greenhouse gas and aerosol concentrations as well as on air quality within years and slow down warming compared to a world with high greenhouse gas emission levels maintained at the current rate over the next 20 years. The co-chairs of Working Group 3 have clearly re-emphasized the need for having the right policies, infrastructure, and technology in place. The enabled changes to our lifestyles and behavior can result in a 40 to 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. There is significant untapped potential and the evidence shows that these lifestyle change, changes can improve our health and well-being. This is very important to us here in the region because we already feel and experience the impacts of climate change. The Pl Pacific Climate Change Center will continue to enhance regional systems to monitor and evaluate the long-term effects of climate change and the success of mitigation, adaptation, and disaster risk management interventions. SPREP also hosts a technical team for the regional NDC hub to address identified needs and priorities of Pacific Island countries to enhance and successfully implement their NDCs and specifically to achieve the objectives that they have set themselves through the Paris Agreement. The Pacific Climate Change Center is committed to improving the flow of practical information between med services, climate practitioners, policymakers, researchers, scientists, and those implementing policies, programs, and projects. This morning, I was just uh, having an induction session with a new employees of SPREP. And one of the things that I stressed was the role of SPREP as a conduit for information in a form that is useful to those that need it. That's one of the core roles we here at SPREP need to fulfill because uh, data and science in itself is not useful un unless it is put into a form that people can digest and act upon. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the partnership with the Australian National University, whom we have been working closely within the Climate Change Center, and especially for this webinar. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Mark Howden, who is the Vice Chair of the Working Group 2 of IPCC, and Professor Frank Jotso, a lead author for the Working Group 3 report, 
and co-author of the summary for policymakers. I hope that the experience these eminent scientists have in translating data and science into policy and action will help us to make this a very useful exchange of information and sharing of experiences. Thank you very much, and I wish you well for all your deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you, Vinaka Vakalevu, Director General, uh, for your remarks. And again, thank you for kindly accepting the requests from the Pacific Climate Change Center to be the champion of the center, as well as the IPCC implementation from SPREP and the Pacific Climate Change Center, Malo. Uh, I would like to now invite Professor Mark Howden uh, for your opening remarks. You have the floor, Professor Mark. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ofa. Um, can you uh, release my video so um, I can show myself on the screen, please? I don't think it's quite there yet. But just whilst that's, oh, here we go. Just while that's uh, sorting out, um, I, I, I just really want to uh, um, reflect those fantastic words that the Director General's just uh, um, started this meeting with. Uh, it's, it's a, um, I think, a really uh, telling and an insightful um, reflection of the significance of what we're talking about today. But before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on who, from who I speak from, um, that's the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, I'm really pleased to be discussing, introducing this discussion from in relation to the IPCC report, the latest IPCC report, the Working Group 3 report on emission reduction or what's called mitigation. And just reflecting very briefly on these IPCC reports, they are in some ways the most reviewed and documented reports in the history of humankind. They are enormous bodies of work in their own right. Um, several thousand pages, several tens of thousand references, tens of thousands of comments made on each of these documents, the assessment reports, and every word and every line is negotiated by the governments of the world in the summary for policymakers. This is an extraordinary document and one which people should be proud of, including those people from the Pacific who have actually contributed to them. And just to reflect on those different reports, the Working Group One report on climate science showed us that the climate and oceans are changing already in ways that we predicted decades ago and that future trajectories of emissions will generate further and much more significant change. The Working Group Two report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability showed that these impacts arising from those climate changes are happening across all lands, continents and islands. They're happening across all oceans and they're happening across all sectors of human activity. They also showed that these impacts may increase further depending on different emission trajectories and what we could do to adapt to those changes under those different emission trajectories. And importantly, identified limits to adaptation, which becomes stronger the more and more climate change progresses. And of course, particular issues covered in the working group report that are very pertinent to the Pacific we're accelerating sea level rise and the impacts of that and the increase in relation to cyclones and cyclone strength. This third assessment report on mitigation is the vital complement to those other two. In very practical ways, it shows us what is needed to move away from the most damaging greenhouse gas emission trajectories. And in doing so, what are the benefits that can arise from emission reduction options that work with and towards enhanced sustainable development, something we've all signed on to. And together, these three IPCC assessment reports, they provide research-backed evidence and massive amounts of research-backed evidence for Pacific Islands and for Pacific Islanders to push for further and more rapid action to limit climate change 
and to adjust to the changes we can't avoid. And that will be to the benefit of all. And lastly, in my very short introductory comments, I would like to thank sincerely the Pacific Climate Change Center and SPREP for their strong partnership in these processes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mark Howden, for um, those brief remarks on the key messages of the IPCC Working Group 2 and the Working Group 3 um, report. Um, I would like to now invite the Honourable Minister of Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and the Samoa Tourism uh, Authority, um, Honourable Toisolo Solo Cetrix uh, Susta, uh, for your keynote address. Thank you, Honourable Minister. You have the floor. Thank you, Wofo. <coughs> Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and our Pacific Aino. Talofa to you all from Samoa. And a special shout out to the mothers on this forum for your invaluable contribution. It is my honor on behalf of the government of Samoa to open this webinar on the IPCC Working Group 3, 6 assessment report on mitigation of climate change released last month. The report provides an updated global assessment of our progress to reducing the rates of climate change, particularly in relation to the Paris Agreement goal. It identifies regional and sector-based sources of emissions, as well as the time and opportunities we have left to take action. The report also looks at whether national commitments and policies are strong enough to achieve long-term emissions goals and areas these could be strengthened. The report finds that global greenhouse emissions have continued to rise over the past decade, despite a temporary drop in emissions due to COVID-19 pandemic. And that global national commitments to reducing emissions need to be strengthened if we are to achieve the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. While most CO2 emissions from existing and currently planned fossil fuel infrastructure are situated in the power sector, most remaining fossil fuels are CO2 emissions and pathways that likely limit to two degrees and below are from the industry and transportation sector. It further confirms that we are not on track to meet the Paris Agreement and warns that unless the nations of the world increase their commitments to making rapid and substantial emission reductions, it is likely that global warming will exceed 1.5 degrees. For us in the Pacific, above 1.5 is not an option. It's the only goal. So we must deploy everything in our arsenal to ensure this is achieved. The science already confirms what we are already living through on a daily basis. The IPCC report is clear that the world has both the technology and policy tools to cost effectively reduce our emissions at the required scale and speed. Global emissions could be cut in half by 2030 at an affordable cost if actions is taken across all countries and sectors. This is partly thanks to the increasing opportunities provided by cleaner and cheaper energy technologies such as solar, wind power, power fuels, electric vehicles, but it also due to proven effectiveness of emission reduction policy packages. The report highlights the importance of reorienting development pathways as drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. There is compelling evidence to show that continuing along development the existing development pathways will not achieve rapid and deep emission reductions. In the absence of shifts in development pathways, conventional mitigation policy instruments may not be able to limit global emissions to a degree sufficient to meet ambitious mitigation goals, or they may not be able to do, do so at a very high economic and social costs. I note some of the recommended pathways for mitigation from the report include robust incentives for 
investments and in innovations, especially incentives reinforced by national policy and international agreements as being central to accelerating low technology change. Many net zero targets are noted from the report as being ambiguously defined and policies need to achieve, achieve them are not in place. Opposition from status quo interests, as well as sufficient, insufficient low carbon financial flows act as barriers to establishing and implementing stringent climate policies covering all sectors. At the COP26 in Glasgow, Pacific Island nations fought hard to, to keep the global warming goal of 1.5 alive, thanks to the great leadership of our Pacific political champions. While we are not quite there yet, I am pleased to note that the Pacific has begun its work towards COP27, maintaining our negotiating priorities, collective positions, united and steadfast in the hope for a 1.5 degree world. What's more, we have the science to prove it thanks to the IPCC. We look forward to continuing our partnership with SPRIP and the PCC and other partners in the region to implement practical solutions and actions to combat climate change and increase the resilience of Pacific peoples and communities. Before I close, I want to, I wish to acknowledge our panel members. Thank you for your time and contribution to this important dialogue. I also like the director of SCRIP. I also urge uh, more Pacific Island scientists um, to engage in this process. I was a bit uh, saddened to see in the report that not one Pacific Island was amongst the writers of these reports. So it's a challenge as we continue in the, forward, in the going forward. I look forward to the discussions and urge participants to make use of this opportunity to learn more about the Working Group 3, 6 assessment report on mitigation and climate change and what this means for our region. So for. That's Thai, uh, Honorable Minister, and we really appreciate those remarks and of course, urging our Pacific to be more involved in the process and write up of the, the IPCC report. Um, thank you also for our Mother's, Mother's Day wishes um, <laughs> and also your support uh, in representing the government of Samoa, but also speaking on behalf of the government of the Pacific. Um, this is the third times uh, we uh, host the IPCC webinar and we have been very fortunate to have the Honorable Minister uh, to champion all these webinars uh, on behalf of the government of Samoa, but also the Pacific uh, Faftai Telelava, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I can see that there's almost 200 participants uh, who are tuning in online. Um, this uh, conclude the formalities. Uh, and I would like to um, maybe ask for a short uh, two minutes break. Uh, before we move to our next uh, agenda item, which is a uh, lecture summary of the IPCC Working Group 3 Mitigation Report um, from Professor Frank Chotso uh, Malo Abito. Oh. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, run through. Uh, Professor Frank, uh, we'll just take a two minutes break just to um, have a uh, take a photo uh, with the I see excellent uh, please enjoy sorry about that thank you can I please invite the participants to um, in here uh, joining in person so please we'll take a, a group photo and then we'll move to session session two thank you
Thank you very much, uh, participants, um, Honorable Minister and uh, Director General. Um, we will now move into the lecture, uh, lecture summary by Professor Frank um, Chotso. Uh, before we get on to that, let me just um, brief uh, the meeting um, on the background of the presenter today. Um, Frank Chotso is a professor at the Australian National University's um, Crawford School of Public Policy um, and head of energy at the ANU Institute for Climate Energy and Disaster Solutions. His roles with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Six Assessment Report are a, as a lead author of the policy chapter and co-author of the summary for policymakers of Working Group Three and also a member of the core writing team of the synthesis report. Frank's um, research spans economics and policy of climate change and energy, including decarbonization, domestic policy choice, and international dimensions of climate policy. He is a joint editor in chief of the Academic General Climate Policy and has advised government um, in Australia and international organizations and contributed largely to policy assessments in countries in the Asia and Pacific. Um, thank you, uh, Frank uh, Chotso, for um, joining today. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, hello, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share some of the key insights from uh, the report uh, with this uh, distinguished group uh, that is that is that is gathering uh, here today. Um, now, the minister made important points about uh, Pacific involvement in international climate change processes, and indeed, of course, the Pacific, uh, the voice of the Pacific, is heard very loudly and clearly. Uh, internationally, uh, including in the in the IPCC, and uh, my dear colleague Mr. Solomon Fifita, of course, is a, a co-lead author uh, in on the uh, on the working group three um, assessment report, and uh, we uh, we enjoyed um, a very good collaboration during these these years of of preparation. Uh, of the report. Uh, but let me not um, spend too long on the preliminaries and, and let me get straight into the summary uh, of this report that we had the pleasure uh, in, in helping to, to prepare. Um, like my colleague um, Mark Howden, Professor Mark Howden explained, this is the uh, largest peer-reviewed scientific assessment exercise in the world um, and, and by a long margin really in comparison uh, to anything else. Um, and the report that results from it is, of course, massive. It is truly a, uh, a comprehensive compendium of everything that we know uh, about how to reduce uh, how, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and really everything um, that that comes with it. And all that I can do is uh, is put a spotlight on some of the findings. Uh, that I think uh, you may find uh, interesting. Now, the structure of the report, um, it comes in 16 chapters, and I really encourage everyone, um, in particular those of you who have a professional interest in climate change policy, I encourage you to actually delve into that underlying material. Um, the chapters are really long and detailed, but they do have very concise summaries uh, at the front, which really signpost very clearly what you can find where. The report covers, broadly speaking, uh, emissions trajectories, past and future, and how they translate into likely temperature outcomes, and how they may be affected by policies and other efforts to reduce emissions. Um, the report then actually spends the bulk of its space on assessing practically uh, all the different options that the world has to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sector by sector, and within each sector, uh, the experiences that have already been made the world over are assessed. And that really is the practical core of the report. And then finally, there are several chapters devoted to the best ways of actually achieving those emission reductions through policy, through finance, through innovation, and so forth. Now, um, the, uh, of course, the sobering headline message, or part of the sobering headline message from the report is that the world is not on track to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. 
uh, in fact, uh, as uh, as one of our uh, senior IPCC colleagues stated in a seminar at ANU recently, um, the clock is no longer at five to midnight, the clock is at midnight for 1.5 degrees. But the positive message uh, from the synthesis is um, that two degrees is certainly possible. And in fact, a temperature outcome below two degrees is possible. Now, the foundation for these assessments are that global emissions have continued to rise, of course, over the previous decade, albeit at a lower rate than in the decade before. Policies to reduce emissions are increasingly implemented and they're being implemented successfully. And so we know how to do this. And the assessment of all the options and their economic costs, the economic mitigation costs, are actually far more optimistic than they were in the past. And that is because of the tremendous reduction in the costs of technologies. And so not only do we know what to do and how to do it, we are also confident that it is actually cheaper than it used to be to reduce emissions and thereby more feasible. So we've wasted collectively a lot of time, very unfortunate, but the path ahead is clear, at least in terms of the technology and economics. Now, what would need to happen to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, of course, many different scenarios for that, but the central case has a global emissions reduction of over 40% between now and 2030. And that's really the basis for, um, for, for a judgment that this is very unlikely to happen. Um, to limit emissions to around two degrees, um, the median trajectory for that has global emissions reduced by about 25% between 2019 and 2030. And that is a very steep ambition, of course, but the technical analysis shows um, that this would indeed be possible. And the way this is possible or would be possible is through comprehensive action to reduce emissions right throughout all sectors of the global economy. And I already mentioned that the bulk of the report is devoted to a bottom-up assessment of all of these different options to reduce emissions. And once you do that on the basis of the scientific literature and practical experiences, once you do that, you find that there are ample opportunities to cut emissions in every part of the world's economy, and in fact, in every country. And you find that many of these options come at really low costs. Some of them would come for free, or in fact have net economic benefits, even before considering the future benefits of reduced climate change. These so-called no regrets options are represented as blue bars here on this chart, if you are able to to see that. Now, the bulk of the global mitigation potential is in the energy sector and in the land sector. The energy sector, it's particular renewable energy deployment and within renewables, particularly solar and wind energy, where the overall largest potentials are, as well as the lowest cost potential in terms of their overall magnitude. In the land sector, it's spread right throughout many different options in agriculture and forestry and land use and land management generally. But there's also plentiful opportunities in the building sector, in transport, in industry, and in many other options. So the message really is we need to get going on everything uh, throughout the economies. And of course, that uh, pertains especially to the highly emissions intensive economies of the world. Now, overall, uh, the assessment is that options to cut emissions by half by 2030 can be identified at uh, mitigation costs below 100 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. That is, of course, quite a high cost compared to the prevailing uh, mitigation costs under most policies, but not under all. So, for example, the European emissions trading scheme has been uh, at price levels similar to that. And the really good news is that about half of that potential or around a quarter reduction in global emissions would come at economic costs or at mitigation costs of less than 20 US dollars per ton. Now, this assumes, of course, that all mitigation options are used uh, and that will not be the case in, in practice. However, 
the picture is really bright in new zero carbon technologies and in particular renewable energy. So the assessment is, as of course we know from casual observation, um, that the costs of key enabling technologies like solar power, like battery technology has plummeted, right? has reduced by 80, 90% in some cases over the span of just one decade. And so that is an absolute game changer. This innovation and the dissemination of clean technologies has made it possible to achieve low or even zero emissions outcomes in many parts of the world. Uh, and I think it's clear that the uh, clean energy revolution, the, in particular the cheap availability of solar coupled with batteries um, can be uh, an absolute boon, not just for decarbonization, but also for local development right throughout the Pacific as well. Very important technology. Now the report also provides a very detailed analysis of enabling factors and practical barriers to implementation of all of these different options. And I've just shown on this slide, which is a very busy slide, some of the assessments within part of the energy portfolio, just to give you a flavor of what that kind of assessment looks like. And what emerges is that every single option to reduce emissions also faces some kind of practical barrier, whether it be a, a, a geophysical barrier or a socioeconomic barrier or an institutional barrier or an economic barrier, okay? Um, and so government's roles is of course, to help overcome these barriers, facilitate investment, help private business and individuals to make the right investment to get the economies uh, onto, onto that track towards net zero emissions. Now I'll spend just a few minutes highlighting some aspects of the report that are new uh, compared to earlier uh, IPCC assessments. Firstly, demand side options. Right? It was earlier mentioned in the seminar uh, that they are lifestyle choices which can also affect aggregate greenhouse gas emissions outcomes. These are formally assessed in this report and the assessment is that there's quite significant emissions reductions that can be achieved through so-called demand side shifts. For example, change in diets towards a more vegetable based diet in particular, shift in demand for products, energy savings in cities and buildings, changes in mobility, so electric mobility, more public transport, less traveling in fact, um, and most of these will require some kind of infrastructure, whether that's physical or societal, as an enabler to help individuals make these low emissions choices, or in fact, make these low emissions choices practical and feasible in practice. So once again, there's an important role for governments as well as the finance industry um, to help, uh, help create the, um, the enabling conditions for these kinds of emission savings. A second issue that I want to highlight as a novel aspects of the assessment in the sixth assessment report is carbon dioxide removal or colloquially called negative emissions. These are now seen as an integral part of future climate change mitigation scenarios. And the reason is simply that uh, as the world hopefully moves to a net zero trajectory, the word net is tremendously important. We do expect that there will be remaining positive greenhouse gas emissions in some very hard to abate sectors or in particular applications where it would be very inconvenient or costly to reduce emissions all the way to zero. And these will be counterbalanced by drawing carbon dioxide directly from the air. That can be done through conventional biological means, photosynthesis, growing plants, one kind of another, or through chemical, chemical and energy driven uh, ways. And that second kind of carbon dioxide removal is really without uh, any practically relevant uh, technical limitation. Uh, it relies on large scale energy uptake and uh, uh, the, uh, the desert areas of this world, including in Australia, uh, would be very well suited for large scale carbon dioxide withdrawal from the air. Now, just to emphasize this assessment report of the working group three places strong emphasis on sustainable development. In fact, on the interplay between reducing emissions and achieving positive 
development outcomes. And that, I would suggest, is something that is very important in the interpretation of this report uh, in the Pacific Island communities. So there is a mapping, in fact, of different uh, emissions reduction options against all of the different sustainable development goals. And once again, just as a flavor of what this looks like, just for two sectors here, I've just chosen the urban sector and the agriculture sector. Um, the report provides an assessment of the particular interactions of each of these mitigation options with each of the SDGs. And a positive message from the assessment is that the very large majority of these interactions are positive ones rather than negative ones. In other words, the goals of reducing emissions actually benefit development objectives, or conversely, development done well will result in lower greenhouse gas emissions. And that, I would submit, is a very powerful message indeed, and a message that deserves highlighting, for example, with donors in the Pacific. Now, let me finish up with some comments on climate finance, international cooperation, and policy as it is assessed in the report. Firstly, climate finance. The IPCC describes it in this assessment as a critical enabling factor for the low carbon transition. So these are pretty strong words uh, in the IPCC context. Three central points here. Firstly, uh, the role of investors, central banks and financial regulators in raising awareness of climate risk. Secondly, the risk of lock-in of high carbon assets and in fact stranded assets, so investments that lose their purpose, if climate compatible investments are delayed for too long. And thirdly, a persistent misallocation of global capital, once again strong language here from the IPCC, uh, as expressed in a large climate finance gap. And what we mean by the climate finance gap is the difference between the amount of money that is currently flowing into climate change mitigation relevant investments and the amount of money that would be needed in order to be on a strong mitigation pathway. And that assessed climate gap, climate financing gap, is especially large for developing countries. And it is very sizable also for this region of the world. Um, here identified as Southeast Asia, as well as the developing Pacific region. And so that, that climate finance gap in aggregate for developing countries is between four times and eight times, meaning existing financial flows for mitigation investment would need to be scaled up fourfold to eightfold. In our region, the corresponding numbers would be between fivefold and twelvefold, according to this analysis, so a lot of work needed to make, uh, to make the money flow. International cooperation. So this um, is overall assessed as a very positive effect on climate change action, but the picture is very nuanced there. First of all, a, a clear empirical finding that participation in international agreements, including the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, has led to more climate policies at the national level and at the subnational level. So that's unambiguously positive. However, there are conflicting assessments as to whether the Paris Agreement and its current mechanisms will in fact achieve its stated goals. And that's a complicated way of saying uh, the emissions targets under the NDCs in aggregate uh, are nearly nowhere near sufficient uh, in order to achieve a temperature outcome well below two degrees. So a lot of strengthening is needed there. The IPCC assesses that there's important roles for international cooperation outside of the UNFCCC process, right? So that's bilateral, regional or sector-based agreements. And once again, I think you can extrapolate that there are good opportunities here for the Pacific realm um, to engage uh, outside of the UNFCCC process, as well as traditionally has been the case so strongly within the UNFCCC process. Fourth, uh, stronger international cooperation is necessary in order to underpin sustainable development and more equitable climate change outcomes. Uh, and overall, just as a side note, very strong emphasis on equity and climate justice in this IPCC assessment. Uh, 
And finally, the IPCC emphasizes the need for international cooperation in order to achieve technology innovation, continued technology innovation, as well as deployment of zero emissions technologies. I'll come to the end with just some remarks on policies and institutions, which is uh, really the bulk of my own work for the IPCC in this assessment round. Firstly, we have a very clear assessment that climate policies and laws have been rapidly rising in number, in number of policies and laws that exist, as well as in the overall coverage of emissions. Implementation of policies to cut emissions has by and large been successful and so successful in terms of actually reducing emissions and there is an empirical assessment of that provided in the report. And very importantly, a lot of practical experience has been gained with the design and implementation of policies to cut emissions. Not just to be effective with a primary goal of reducing emissions, but also to meet other hallmarks of what such policies need to achieve. For example, to shield low income households, shield the poor against unintended effects, for example, through energy price increases. We know how to do this. We know in detail how to design climate policy to make it economically beneficial and politically and socially acceptable. It is also clear that there's a range, a really huge range of policies that can be complementary, and that the best way to go about uh, policy implementation is to put together deliberate policy packages, as we call them in the IPCC report. And those policy packages may include economic instruments, especially and in, uh, in particular emissions trading or carbon pricing, carbon taxes. They will include regulatory instruments uh, to, to achieve specific objectives in specific sectors, either for higher cost options uh, or where carbon pricing is not feasible or practical. They can include mitigation subsidies for particular actions, uh, research and development support. They may include fossil fuel subsidy removal. They may include policies to enhance information to consumers and businesses and many others as well. The overall tenor here is that good climate policy is really the same as good economic and social policy, and that policy needs to be climate policy needs to be mainstreamed within government. Finally, and this is the, the end of my, of my talk, thank you very much for uh, staying with me so far. Institutions for effective greenhouse gas mitigation. So climate policies cannot be just enacted in isolation from society. It is very important in the IPCC's assessment to have strong capability, including education for climate policy right throughout society, but of course, in particular, um, within governments and the business sector. It is equally important to have strong and capable independent institutions to help with climate policy, design and mainstreaming and education, as well as a media, for example, and NGOs that are uh, knowledgeable and capable uh, to involve in the climate change policy discourse. And finally, the importance is emphasized of engagement by all significant actors in society on climate change policy in order to achieve the kinds of changes and achieve them rapidly that are needed uh, we need a thorough conversation um, and we need not constrain uh, the discussion that we're having to expert circles um, and to and to the very and to the usually narrow policy uh, circles that that these discussions have been taking place in. We need to bring climate change policy, including emissions reduction policy, right into the middle. Uh, of the conversations uh, that we have in our societies. Thank you very much. And I very much look forward to the contributions by the other panelists and to subsequent uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Frank, uh, for your inform informative presentation, um, covering a wide range of topics uh, from the IPCC Working Group 3, Mitigation on Climate Change, um, on the emission curve, the uh, practical emissions reduction options and ways to achieve them. And also uh, importantly, 
uh, on the medication options for the Pacific and opportunities for people of the Pacific to engage in the IPCC process and work. Um, thank you again for those informative remarks and presentation, uh, Professor Frank. Um, thank you participants for uh, staying the course with us. Um, just a kind reminder um, that if you have a uh, question to, um, to post, uh, please enter them into the Q&A box and we will have a Q&A session after the panel session, which is in session two. Um, thank you very much. Um, I will now move to our second session, uh, which is the Talanoa session with the Pacific and international experts on how do emission trends uh, compare to climate change calls in the Pacific and how can we limit further warming? Um, and I would like to uh, firstly introduce the panel members and um, for our uh, panel session. Um, I have four distinguished panelists here. Um, First one is Mr. Solomon Fifita, Maloyele Solomon. Um, he is the manager of the Pacific Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, or the PICRI. Um, Solomon was the former head of the Pacific Regional Energy Program, housed at the Economic Development Division of the Pacific Community in Suva, Fiji. He has served as a project manager for regional energy and climate change projects for the Pacific Islands. And prior to that, he was the energy planner for the Kingdom of Tonga. Solomone was a lead author in the IPCC special report on, re on renewable energy and the IPCC fifth assessment report um, and was recently a lead reviewer of the national communications for the UNFCCC and the IPCC six assessment report, working group three. Malo Peter Solomone, Ahoni. Um, may I also introduce uh, speaker number two, uh, Ms. Pasha Karuthis. Uh, Pasha has extensive uh, experience in climate change and has worked with the University of the South Pacific as a research community advisor. She was the former climate change advisor for the North Pacific SPC regional office. She has held various roles as climate change negotiator and expert in climate change for Cook Islands. Kiaorana Pasha, and thank you for joining us today. Um, the uh, speaker number three uh, is none other than Mr. Tuiti Chilton. Um, Tuti has been a teacher for 18 years at the Palau Community College and continues to work using sports as a vehicle for development, specifically with wrestling and now with archery uh, and sailing. He is currently the steering committee chair for the Pacific NDC Hub, the executive director for the Palau Energy Administration and focal point for Palau's NDC's Talofalava, Mr. Jilton. Um, speaker number four, the last speaker uh, in our panel session is uh, Ms. Yvette Kaislake, uh, Technical Advisor, Science to Services from the Pacific Climate Change Center here at SPREP. Uh, she has more than 10 years of working experience in environment and climate change at senior level uh, and assistant rep uh, resident representative and program manager uh, for the environment, energy and climate change for the UNDP. Uh, Ms. Chris Lake is also, was also a manager and coordinator uh, and principal uh, officer at the um, government of Samoa. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, uh, Ms. Uh, Yvette Chris Lake. Um, participants, that's our four distinguished panelists for our Talano session. And I would like to um, go ahead with um, the panel questions. Uh, the, first, the first question is uh, to Mr. Solomon Fifita. Uh, Solomon Fifita, uh, as a Pacific author, uh, if you could share your experience of being part of the IPCC expert group, what are some of the challenges that you face and how Pacific scientists can be more involved in the IPCC? Malo Peter Solomon. Uh, thank you, uh, Ofa, and uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating my uh, former colleague, uh, Sefanaya, on his appointment to uh, head uh, SPREP. I got introduced to the work of the IPCC through my time at uh, SPREP, 
uh, 2004 to 2010. Um, and I can recall that at the time there was a formal communication from the UNFCCC. Uh, this was probably around the early 2000s, calling on uh, parties to nominate national experts into the UNFCCC's roster of uh, experts. And uh, people were to complete a form and to fill in the area of their expertise, uh, including national circumstances, the uh, greenhouse gas inventory um, policies, measure and mitigation options, technology transfers, vulnerability assessment, among others. For myself, I don't regard myself as a scientist. I am just a former civil servant with uh, some training in land management and development, as well as in energy policy and planning. I have worked at both the national and regional level and have built up a good network of energy and mitigation uh, in the region and beyond. So I regard myself uh, just as a uh, practitioner in energy planning and uh, policy a project manager for renewable energy and uh, greenhouse gas mitigation projects. So I don't regard myself as an expert in mitigation because I'm only restricted uh, to the energy sector. On the question of how can Pacific scientists can be more involved in the work of the IPCC, I think the first thing to do is to get registered in the UNFCCC roster of experts through the um, UNFCCC focal point. I just had a look at the, the roster uh, during the weekend and I can see in Samoa there's only one. In Tonga there, are, there is another one beside myself. In Manuatu there are two. Maso Islands two. Kiribati one. Um, so, um, I think we, we all appreciate that uh, for the IPCC, when they uh, uh, select the uh, offers, they consider fair representation among developed and developing countries, North and South, seats and non-seats, as well as males and females. And uh, both the IPCC and the UNFCCC refer to the ro roster of experts when picking people. So if we don't increase the number of registered Pacific experts, it's more like wanting to change the comment of the day, but we're not telling people to go to the polling stations and cast their votes. Um, on the challenges of being involved in the work of the IPCC, uh, I think the first thing is the time commitment. There's a lot of research, reading, analysis, and writing. And, um, in my case, I'm doing this on top of my full-time paid job. And uh, the, it takes four years to produce the report and you have um, to stay engaged uh, during those four years. Uh, fortunately, there are four scheduled um, lead office meeting, meetings where chapter comes together to discuss and to write uh, within the chapter, but also to ensure uh, your ch assigned uh, chapter is aligned and is consistent with the work of the chapter and other working groups. So it's very important to attend this uh, lead office meeting. Uh, for my case, I, I missed the third and the fourth meetings and I really struggled. To get up with, uh, to catch up with the work of our uh, chapter. Another challenge for the Pacific Islands is the lack of peer-reviewed documents because the 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 information and data that goes into the IPCC reports are peer-reviewed uh, uh, materials. And what we find uh, commonly find in our region. It's just project reports or consultancy and feasibility study reports um, that are not 
published in world-renowned uh, journals and where they have been peer reviewed uh, by fellow colleagues and, and experts. So it's extremely difficult to have a specific case study, for example, or to make some specific reference to the uh, Pacific, um, except of course for published uh, reports by uh, uh, NIWA uh, on their researches, et cetera. Um, I tend to think that uh, academics do better in the work of the IPCC because they are readily accessible to their latest peer-reviewed materials and channels, and they, they get supported uh, by their fellow university um, universities as well as students, uh, um, for example. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Professor Patrick Nunn of uh, USP, uh, who was one of the academics from the region uh, working um, for uh, IPCC. And the last uh, challenge is the reconciliation of uh, different views. Eh? Um, in the work uh, of, of the chapters, there are always uh, heated debates. There are various views, various experiences, and uh, there are various interest groups uh, 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 who are involved. Um, and there are always rumors that some people are being sponsored to push forward certain views, but I don't believe that um, because I have all the confidence uh, on the IPCC system in its uh, due diligence uh, process. Um, I think those are the, the challenges I, I came across uh, in my involvement uh, with the IPCC offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Malo Pita Solomone, for those insightful responses, um, sharing your experiences, and also the uh, challenges uh, that we are facing uh, from the Pacific. Uh, Malo Pita Solomone, um, and um, we appreciate your uh, insightful responses uh, to the question. Um, may I now move on to Ms. Pasha? Um, Pasha, as a lead climate change scientist and being editor of the Pacific chapter for IPCC, how have you been involved and what is your recommendation for other countries in the way forward? Malo Pasha. Malo Lele and Metaki Mata. Um, kia ora na everyone uh, from Aratonga. Um, in terms of I, the involvement with the chapter, similar to Solomone, um, I actually got nominated. I wouldn't have been involved if I hadn't been nominated by Aron Anari, who was a former director that I, well, he's current director, but I was working with him at the Cook Islands Meteorological Service many years ago. Um, and when the call for editors, uh, well, for authors went out, uh, Arona nominated me. And so that would be one of the things I would say to everybody listening in today, make sure that uh, the nominations go to the IPCC when they do these calls, whether it's for a special report on oceans, whether it's a, um, the at the impact of 1.5 degrees or the general annual uh, multi-year assessment reports. Uh, they, the governments determine uh, what reports are going to be requested from the IPCC. So as soon as they're thinking about uh, requesting some of these reports, it's important we get our Pacific Islanders involved. And like Solomon said, uh, we might not be uh, scientists. I'm not, I don't have a PhD or a doctorate. I've, I've got a diploma in international relations, basically. Um, but I think that being part of this process showed me that it was possible to make a contribution and increase our own understanding uh, here within the region of how the IPCC works and that it's a, a very thorough and useful process to be involved in. Um, once I was nominated, um, 
the IPCC sent out a, a form basically that said, what chapters are you interested in? And I uh, said I was most interested in and qualified for uh, talking about adaptation. Uh, but very early in my career, the first international meeting I went to on behalf of the government of the Cook Islands had been an IPCC working group three um, summary for policy makers in Ghana in two, the year 2000. So I think that's why they um, asked me to take on the role of a review editor in working group uh, three, looking at the chapter on international cooperation. It was a very good experience. Um, there was a, a range of authors from all over the world involved. Uh, the process, my role was to look at all the thousands of comments that came in on that specific chapter and make sure that the authors addressed them fairly. I had to read and read and read a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of reading. Um, and then also a lot of very late night meetings at unusual hours. That's one of the challenges that uh, Solomon had referred to. A lot of uh, late night meetings where uh, we, uh, just to follow the authors through that process of addressing the comments that were made, making sure that the literature that was out there, and unfortunately, as Solomon said, not much of it was published in the Pacific on the, the subjects that we were looking at, a little bit more around international cooperation. Um, but the problem when um, that I noticed when um, the literature didn't re refer to um, something that was maybe a bit sensitive or an emerging topic like loss and damage um, was what happened was that would be left out of the final draft um, because the chances of it making through um, government reviews um, for the final approval were maybe a bit slim if there wasn't a lot of documentation to back it up and a lot of research already on that topic. Um, so in terms of uh, the priority of my recommendations for countries going forward um, is to engage in the processes, um, you know, and then what we're hearing out of the summary that Frank just made about the fact that we're not on track to meet 1.5, um, unfortunately, that it is still possible if massive action is taken, um, but is for our governments in the Pacific and everywhere really, is to look at areas where the co-benefits of addressing adapt uh, mitigation priorities um, are really, uh, conducive to overall sustainable development. Things like looking at the, the coastal protection, um, healthy reefs and islands help minimize uh, coastal erosion. And then at the same time, they act as um, carbon sinks, very effective carbon sinks. And then things like the technology in the transport area, which really is already out there um, in the marine transport area, for example, there's much more efficient and solar outboard engines, which we just don't see being used widely in the Pacific yet. Um, it would just be so great if there was some technology transfer that that process comes through the UNFCC and other international cooperation, um, but it, to disseminate that uh, technology within our Pacific region. And I see the role of the Pacific Climate Change Center um, and other regional organizations as really pushing locally appropriate technologies that also have mitigation benefits. So that would be my recommendation. I don't want to take too much time um, because I'm sure we have interesting contributions from the others, but uh, so, and. Metaki Maata, Ms. Pasha, and I, I think we all appreciate your uh, passion and also your contribution to be involved in the IPCC process um, in order to assist our countries uh, in the Pacific. Also great reflections on your experiences um, and contribution. Um, I'm sure those contributions have helped to elevate our Pacific voice 
in the context of the IPCC and climate change, Malo Pito Pasha. Um, may I now move on to uh, to T. Uh, Chilton, the um, chair of the NDC Hub. Um, the IPCC report uh, inform policymakers what scientists know about climate change. Um, as your uh, role as chair of the NDC Hub, what would this entail for the Pacific region and the role of the Pacific NDC Hub? Thank you. Hello, Ali, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ofa, for the question. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I just want to recognize a colleague of mine, Banda, is there at the, the office. Uh, she's the one helping me out a lot with uh, the work I'm doing here with the uh, chairmanship of the Regional Pacific NDC Hub. Uh, first and foremost, uh, important thing I'd just like to, to mention is uh, based on all the different reports from IPCC, we do know in terms of climate change, it does have a big effect on Pacific Islands, uh, specifically surface temperatures, rain patterns, uh, cyclones, um, sea level rise and so with that in mind i like to just try to transition into the idea that uh, these pacific islands and the challenges that there are seen from these threats specifically for long-term development and security of the region has significantly compromised their populations livelihood and food security there have also been more recent push from pacific island nations and territories in terms of livelihood um, and damages uh, to be able to be discuss this in terms of climate change uh, and uh, um, climate change uh, issues that are associated with damages and losses and how to bring that into uh, discussions, specifically when the vulnerability uh, for Pacific Islands and island nations themselves are, are very strong, specifically in the issues of displacement and possible resettlement of whole communities from low-lying islands and states. So. With those kind of reports that have already been put together, uh, the, the Regional Pacific NDC Hub finds itself positioned in a great position to be able to help Pacific Island countries implement their NDCs, uh, issues of mitigation, as well as developing uh, their sustainable pathways uh, to fossil fuel free uh, NDC commitments, as, as well as developing the economy. Uh, some examples I'd like to share with you is how the NDC Hub has supported Tonga and Samoa in developing their second NDCs, which have already been updated to the UNFCCC website. The NDC Hub has also supported NDC roadmaps, investment plans, and guiding countries in realizing their ambitious NDC targets. So the NDC Hub is also supporting um, the training and the expertise in measurement, reporting, and verification, the MRV systems, to support all of our members in collecting data that is needed to report greenhouse gases, baseline, and emissions reductions. And as well as the NDC Hub has been supporting specific requests from island nations. Um, a good example is the incorporating climate change education in the school curriculum that was helped develop from NARU and their use as well as developing the energy efficiency regulations uh, for uh, specifically here in Palau. Uh, th these are all the different uh, activities that the NDC hub has been able to, to uh, share with other Pacific Island countries. Uh, at the same time, I'd just like to, real, uh, to reiterate uh, for those of you who are listening that the Pacific NDC hub is, we're trying to make it as a one-stop shop. So any kind of question that you may have uh, in the context of mitigation, in the context of adaptation, uh, when it comes to climate change or climate crisis, as we look at it these days, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to our office. Uh, we're trying to make sure we're dealing with partners and funders. We're trying to deal with uh, Pacific Island countries and territories, and then make sure that we meet each other's needs as best as possible, based on um, the great work that IPCC has done and the, the results that are there. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to just kind of highlight uh, in the context of uh, answering a question from Lydia is uh, what NDC Hub has been able to, to kind of address is what are the two key barriers for mitigation in the energy sector in the region. And one of the, the two major things that we look at uh, from the surveys and the work we've done with different countries is number one, human capacity to be able to implement those technologies uh, that are needed on island. We need more training on that. 
and then as well as financial resources or options to be able to get those technologies to deal with mitigation in place. Uh, so for example, out of Palau, uh, we would love to become 100% fossil fuel free. One of the paths that we're using now is possibility of green, um, green hydrogen. Um, and again, there's no one on island that is able to um, uh, develop, store, and maintain uh, quote unquote green hydrogen in Palau in the context of batteries. Or, or fuel cells. And even though that's a possibility of a technology that is useful uh, because we, we lack the human capacity and the technology to be able to implement. And at the same time, because of our size, we lack the financial resources and options to be able to get that technology implemented on island. So to answer your question of why in terms of what does the Pacific NPC hub, what can we provide as a role? Once again, just want to reiterate, we are a one-stop shop we're here to make sure we take care of any of your technical um, uh, questions that you have and making sure that we connect you to the proper people. And once again, Christian and Rebecca and Wanda are the technical individuals that help us do that. And we are the focal points from the countries to try to share those questions um, and issues that we have for survival of each territories. So thank you very much, everyone, for those comments. Thank you, Ofa. Meso Lang, uh, Mr. Tuiti, and thank you for those um, insightful remarks. And uh, I would also like to echo your comments on the work of the NDC Hub and also acknowledging their uh, great work in the Pacific, but also the Pacific Climate Change Center is also a beneficiary of your uh, NDC Hub expertise. So I would like to acknowledge your work with your colleagues, uh, Venda, uh, and others from the region organizations. Um, in driving the NTC uh, implementation. Um, I also note the barriers to um, implementing the mitigation uh, options in the Pacific. Uh, first is capacity building and also the financial commitment, which we agree very much. Um, thank you again for those insightful remarks. Um, our last speaker for this panel session is Ms. Yvette Kesslake. Um, and she is the technical advisor for the Pacific Climate Change Center for Science and Services. Um, Yvette, uh, if you can elaborate on the role of the Pacific Climate Change Center and how it relates to the IPCC recent findings. Um, and also if you could uh, introduce the fact sheets that have been produced in partnership with ANU, which has the briefs of the Working Group 3 um, report. Malo Yvette. Hello, Alpito Ofa, um, Talofalava to all our participants online and also those uh, present here at the Pacific Climate Change Center. As you may be aware, this is the third Pacific IPCC webinar hosted by the Pacific Climate Change Center with SPREP um, and also in partnership with the Australian National University. And the main objectives of these forums is we're looking at closing the knowledge gap in the Pacific region around the world of uh, work of the IPCC, but also to provide the most up-to-date synthesis in terms of relevant climate change information to diverse Pacific Island um, audiences. Uh, the Pacific Climate Change Center also partnered with Climate Analytics and SPRIP um, and had a closed forum for discussion of the IPCC Working Group 2 and 3 final government distribution. Uh, so the, the main um, outcome of these forums is that we discuss key challenges with the report and the modalities of the IPCC plenary to strengthen um, the Pacific. We also elaborate on the link between the work of the IPCC and the UNFCCC negotiations, and also looking at strengthening regional coordination and cooperation on scientific issues, um, including the IPCC reports um, between IPCC and UNFCC focal points, uh, the regional scientific community, and also all other stakeholders. As you may be aware, um, the, the Pacific Climate Change Center has four main functions, um, which is research, capacity building, knowledge brokerage, and also innovation. And the main vision is that it will provide practical support and training to address adaptation and mitigation um, priorities in the Pacific. Um, as um, our moderator has also alluded to, the um, Pacific Climate Change Center, SPRIP, as well as ANU have developed fact sheets focused on the following three um, themes. So the fact sheets will provide uh, really short, quick pops of information and general messaging um, that can be used by our Pacific Island countries and territories, and also at the national level. 
Uh, so those that have been produced are financing technology, greenhouse gas emissions, and also uh, mitigation and development pathways. So the Pacific Climate Change Center is committed to using the IPCC fundings as well as peer reviewed uh, Pacific research as a scientific basis to provide uh, science services and products to be used by our Pacific Island countries. And also uh, in terms of climate action as guided by the regional roadmap of strength and climate services, the Pacific Island Meteorological um, Strategy or PIMS in short, as well as the Pacific um, Climate Change Science and Services Roadmap. Um, as the uh, Director General has rightly said in his opening remarks, um, it's very important that we transform the science or data into information that can be used at the national level by our Pacific Island countries. And as the Honorable Minister has also um, referred to in his keynote address and as also as shared by our fellow panelists who are also authors or also um, um, editors in this um, process, that we need to encourage more uh, Pacific uh, research, but also Pacific authors in the IPCC uh, research. So from the Pacific Science, uh, Pacific Climate Change Center, we believe that the science to services function will provide a gateway for the Pacific out of this climate crisis and more towards a sustainable future for our Pacific Island countries and territories. Thank you. Tafti Lava, um, Ms. Yvette, for uh, those remarks um, describing the key core functions of the center, but also our role in the implementation of the, um, the working group three and other IPCC reports. Uh, Malo Alpito. Um, colleagues online, thank you again for um, staying with us. Uh, we now um, close the panel session, but I would like to request that our uh, panel panelists could just stay online with uh, me because we have some Q and A, uh, some questions on the Q and A chat box, uh, which need to be uh, addressed. Um, the time for the for this webinar was actually set to close at four, so we have some time for Q and A. And if we uh, won't be able to address all the questions, please note that we will address them out of session. Our uh, distinguished distinguished panelists will um, respond of session if we won't be able to cover all the Q uh, the questions on the Q and A chat box. Um, the first one uh, I have here is to Frank, uh, Professor Frank. Um, there are various analyses show that the pathway of emission targets ex expressed in the NTC of Australia will, will lead to a temperature rise of four degrees Celsius. It would seem that the Q GOA is not heeding the advice from its own experts and scientists, let alone the rallying call from Pacific Island countries for large emitters like Australia to take the lead as a member of the Pacific family. Are there any strategies to get countries like Australia to listen and show more sensitivity to the biggest concern, um, for example, the climate security, as well as provide additional climate finance to assist Pacific Island countries in their efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change? Thank you, Frank. Yes, thank you very much indeed for the question. Um, it is a very political question, and so I won't directly comment on the, on the politics of, of this. Um, now, uh, it is clear in, in really all uh, independent assessments that Australia's existing 2030 emissions target uh, is relatively weak. Um, it is also very, very easy to achieve. And so the, the, the road is wide open, the gate is wide open uh, to a stronger 2030 emissions target, in fact, uh, for a much stronger one. So the existing one is a 26 to 28% reduction. Um, and, you know, very tellingly, the Business Council of Australia, which is really the main business association, is calling for a 50% emissions reduction target, which would be much more in line um, with, with a strong global uh, mitigation uh, outcome. As a small footnote, the, the assertion that the current emissions target is, um, you know, leads or is in line with a four degree uh, temperature rise, it is fundamentally not possible to uh, to uh, attribute any particular country's emission reduction to a global temperature outcome because 
Firstly, it depends on what everyone else is doing. And secondly, of course, it depends on the trajectory of emissions beyond 2030. So it's not that easy, um, but it's certainly true that the existing target is out of line um, with anything like a two degree outcome. Um, and it's also really easy for Australia to do a lot better. Now, the bottleneck in Australia is very much a political one. You know, successive leaders of different federal governments have used climate change as a politically punching ball. And, um, uh, you know, it's it's unfortunately always played in one way or another in the elections. There's an election campaign on at the moment as well. And in some ways, uh, you know, thankfully, climate change is is not among the top contentious issues in this particular election campaign now, which makes me quietly optimistic that perhaps some more pro progress can be made after this federal election uh, in Australia. I don't want to take too much time, but the aspect of the comment before on uh, or the question on finance is really important. Um, it is very obvious that much more finance, both for climate change adaptation and for emissions reductions, needs to flow to the region and in particular to the Pacific. Um, you know, there's an obvious, uh, you know, uh, close relationship between uh, Australia and the Pacific countries and a relationship that should be a much better and much warmer one than it, than it has been. Um, and part of that in my considered view, will be for Australia to provide significantly more resourcing for climate action in the Pacific. Um, the case for it is very obvious, and I think the case needs to be made again and again and again um, for, for incremental or perhaps more than incremental progress uh, to be made on this. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for those responses, uh, Professor Frank. Um, the, this question, um, can I pose this question to uh, Ms. Pasha and also to Solomon? Uh, moving from traditional vehicle to electric vehicles does not seem to be such a good solution, looking at the environmental impact of their production, at the electricity for batteries, uh, which can come from fossil fuel. Not sure if it's, uh, it's a clever transition. Would you like to respond to that, um, Ms. Pasha? Thank you. Kia ora na. Yeah, um, I was actually just typing a response to that answer. Um, from what I'm learning about electronic vehicles is that um, the difference between them and fossil fuel powered vehicles is fossil fuel powered vehicles in the Pacific, um, they are very much, uh, they produce noxious fumes over their entire life. They're dependent on imported fuels so when there's a natural disaster like a cyclone that affects a harbor um, we've had that happen here in the cook islands there's it's often many weeks before they can even get the fuel to run their generators and keep their fridges going and things like that so by having an e-vehicle it's actually possible with the newer ones to reverse cycle them and run a household for two or three days um, on that charge of that e-vehicle. So they're also a resilience um, measure. Uh, and also they contribute to self uh, sustainability because we can use solar panels and other uh, renewable energy sources to power them. Uh, so overall, over the lifespan of a a vehicle. Uh, also, when they come to the end of their life, the batteries can be removed and recycled or reused um, as storage uh, for things like uh, household use. Just like I mentioned, you can run a house off it for a few days where they can be repurposed as solar battery storage and other things, even if they're not powerful enough as batteries anymore to, to run a vehicle, uh, which has a high power demand. So increasingly they are making sense for Pacific Islands because we are remote and I'll let Solomon add anything <laughs> that he wants to that um, and there's also new technology that's making batteries more environmentally friendly uh, using things like hemp and all sorts of other alternative substances and as they become greater in the market there'll be more pressure to make them more environmentally friendly. Uh, thank you, uh, Basha. Um, I think that the, 
the big uh, issue is the fact that uh, the Pacific Islands need to do thing, do something about the transport sector, uh, given the fact that most of the fossil fuel is consumed in the transport sector. So we can talk about significantly reducing our emissions without addressing efficiency in the transport sector. And I, I, I think it's very encouraging to note that in the initial NDCs, um, transport was missing from there. And the, the review that the NDC hub has uh, conducted as well as partners such as uh, Triple GI, um, countries have realized the importance of including uh, efficiency in the transport sector um, in its mitigation um, uh, options. And of course, there are other options. It's not only uh, uh, electric uh, vehicles, uh, non-motorized options such as walking and cycling are options too. Um, and and the electric vehicles is another, is another option. Uh, I think one of the things that we have learned from COVID is that we can work from home, school can be done remotely, uh, you can pay your bills electronically, you don't need to go to church, you can do prayers from home uh, via the internet. And I think those are also options that are related to uh, uh, mobility and uh, uh, improving efficiency in the transport uh, sector. In 2019, the uh, Pacific Energy Ministers directed uh, SPC to develop uh, an e-mobility program, regional program. And uh, right now, this uh, Pacific Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, we are rolling out uh, that program. And that program is a, it's a readiness. It's to prepare uh, BICs to make the informed choices of whether to embrace uh, uh, electric vehicles or not. Um, we are seeing increasing number of, of electric vehicles in the roads of uh, Pacific Islands. And uh, I think the trend will continue while climbing and uh, we need to be prepared with that um, policy as well as the uh, safety and the uh, technical um, uh, measures uh, to ensure that technology suits the needs and the environment of uh, PICs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitak uh, Maata and Malua Pito Pasha and Solomon for those responses to the question. Um, I would like to post this question again to Solomon. It is from Tonga. Um, what recommendations can you share on Tonga's tourism sector in engaging climate change initiatives following the Hunga Tonga Hunga Apai um, tsunami and volcanic eruption. Thank uh, you, thank, yeah, thank you, Ofa. I think there are um, uh, options that we can look at. The uh, efficiency of the uh, uh, sector is, is one area. Um, uh, I'm not too sure in terms of uh, damages to uh, uh, tourism uh, um, accommodations, but that's something that can be looked at in terms of uh, uh, improving the resilience of, uh, of those um, infrastructure. Uh, but we are right next door to a, a tourism office in Tonga and would uh, welcome um, having a, a discussion with um, the tourism office in here on what options we can provide to assist them. Thank you. Malo Apito Solomone, and I'm sure our colleagues from Tonga um, has heard you loud and clear um, on the recommendation uh, from your side with regards to this question. Um, this, can I post this to, uh, to T or um, uh, any of the panelists? What would be the two key barriers to mitigation in the energy sector regionally? Thank you. Thank you, Ofai. I think I kind of referred to that in the last presentation. I just talked about human capacity um, as well as finance. 
uh, one of the key issues that we, we see within working with the, uh, the NDC hub and, and all the members, is just like what Solomon said in terms of uh, the EV uh, report uh, that they're doing. Uh, all the islands want to do these things. We want to be able to be fossil fuel free. It's just the steps that needs to be taken um, to get there are usually the ones that are affecting us from not getting there. And one of the biggest ones here in Palau that I can talk about is um, our guys that work in the utilities. They're, they're used to working with lines. They, they're starting to learn how to use solar, but we don't have any um, uh, wind uh, technologies here or even hydrogen. So it's a human capacity issue. And I'm hoping that the NBC hub in the future will be able to do some of these kind of trainings that allow us to at least have uh, a full scale a system in an island that can bring in the training into it. So we'll have that going rather than trying to spread the money in the, the 13 countries. Let's just really try to focus and see how, how can we build an island to get to that level in terms of mitigation as well as adaptation. And then I'll turn it over to Frank if uh, you want to add something. Oh, thank you. Yes, I would like to add something, and that's on finance in particular. Um, so the fundamental characteristic of a clean energy system, a renewables-based energy system, is that almost all of the cost is upfront, right? And then you've got decades, if it's, if it's reasonably maintained, of free energy. Right. Um, and so the financing issues really come center stage. Um, anything like high interest rates, high rates of return because of perceived risk um, will work against it. Um, anything like being credit constrained, you know, not getting being able to get a large scale loan or not governments not being able to go into debt for it constrains what would otherwise be a perfectly worthwhile economic uh, investment. In the longer term, you know, um, replacing in particular diesel generators of different kinds um, with solar or other renewable energy plus battery combinations is now by and large cost competitive as well as clean in terms of local air pollution um, and greenhouse gas emissions and oftentimes more reliable as well. So it's kind of win, 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 but it's often the funding and finance that that is missing. And sometimes it's also simply established practice, right? Um, the normal way to do things is to replace the diesel generator with a diesel generator. And, and that is where the thinking needs, needs to change. And of course, this is not an issue that's confined to the Pacific, right? We encounter these kinds of barriers everywhere in the world. Um, maybe if I can contribute to this, um, I think we, we all know um, that uh, in the Pacific Islands, the growth in the demand for fossil fuel is so much faster than the growth in the installed renewable energy capacity on the ground. Um, so I, I guess uh, if one has to look at the um, uh, NDCs, the conditional targets are based on so uh, many uh, new capacity of renewable energy installations. But then the condition is based on the availability of the finance, uh, as uh, Frank has spoken about, um, and uh, um, the technology transfer uh, also. Um, on the other hand, we also need to look at uh, ways of creating a uh, um, eco playing ground for fossil fuel and renewable energy. And one of the ideas that has floated around is to explore uh, um, a decision that, that come from ministers or, or from leaders uh, to look at uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies uh, um, in the region. Um, I think the, that's something that, that is flagged on the outcome of COP26 uh, also. Um, but, but this has been an idea that uh, we at SPC have been uh, trying to push is to study and, and look, the, look at the extent of uh, fossil fuel subsidy in the region and to try to get a collective uh, decision by leaders that uh, fossil fuel subsidies should be uh, phased out by a certain date. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Solomon and uh, Professor Frank for um, those remarks uh, responding to our uh, question. Um, can I please pose this question to uh, maybe Basha um, and of course the um, other panelists um, can also contribute. How, that, how are the impacts of climate change influencing regional security policies and alliance formation for Pacific Island nations? Oh, uh, that's quite a political question as well. Um, just uh, so I won't answer it directly, but I definitely think that um, one of the things that we we started seeing even before, um, like in the before the COVID pandemic, was um, more and more countries looking at migration issues either within them or between them, and some countries opting to uh, possibly um, explore buying land for food security purposes um, in other countries, uh, and uh, the migration question and apply for applying for um, options for migration with dignity. Uh, there's a whole forum on this, um, but it's not necessarily so much addressed in the um, IPCC Working Group 3 um, chapter on mitigation, uh, but it's very apparent that as time goes on and we approach um, the, the excessive temperature beyond 1.5, um, it, that uh, this will need to be elaborated more. What are the implications for uh, insufficient mitigation unless we're able to really ramp it up um, for security? And there are reports that in the literature that do look at this to some extent, um, but it wasn't necessarily Pacific focused literature from what I recall. Um, it was more the US and larger countries doing these kind of analyses of security and climate change. Thank you uh, very much, Pasha. And um, we're also fortunate to have the Director of Climate Change here, it's PREP. Um, and I would like to request for her feedback and also her uh, response to that question. Thank you, um, Tangalo. <coughs> Thank you very much, moderator. I acknowledge the Director General of SPRIP today and joining us in the webinar. And may I take the opportunity to congratulate the panelists here today. Um, I learned a lot from this webinar. And it's not often that I have the privilege of sitting uh, amongst um, experts such as yourselves. Pasha answered that question really well but I want to just extend from the last part of, of, of her answer, but also um, acknowledge that, you know, the UN identifies um, climate change as a threat to climate security, I uh, sorry, to, to security, because it undermines livelihoods. It creates uh, an increase in the migration needs. It also, when it undermines livelihoods, it impacts political security um, and it weakens the resilience and ability of, of countries to respond effectively. And so when you think about the Pacific and we're embarking on this as a group of organizations that support countries, we've never had a expanded definition of security. When we talk about security, it's always about traditional security, immigration, policing, uh, Etc. And so now the Pacific is at that point where we have to have the conversation about expanding that definition to include climate change security. And so what is the Pacific doing about that? Um, the Pacific is mobilizing itself uh, in, a, in a response because one of our countries, Samoa, has included in their security policy climate change security and other countries are, are keen to follow suit. At the moment, we are, and this is, follows from, from your comment, Pasha, and in support of it as well, there is a mapping exercise set to happen so that we do know what we are doing as a, as a region. As to the part of question to allegiances, allegiances and allies, willing allies, 
that's not uh, within our mandate to talk about, the, the political leadership uh, discussion, but I just wanted to say here that as an organization supporting our countries, these findings from the report you're engaged in have, have and will continue to inform the work on developing a climate change security work stream. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director, for uh, those uh, perspective and also uh, those reflections, which is very much appreciated. Um, and also, also acknowledging uh, the responses from Pasha. Um, colleagues, we only have 10 minutes uh, before four, so this will be the last question. Um, and I would like to invite my colleague, uh, Yvette, to please respond to this question. The Working Group 3 IPCC report this time has a chapter on demand services and social aspects of mitigation. It also talks about inequities in countries and societies in consumption patterns. As some of the smallest emitters of THGs, what is the implication of this to the Pacific small island states? Thank you, Yvette. Thank you, Ofa. Um, this is true. Our Pacific island nation has also small island development states amongst the lowest emitters. Um, I recall it's less than 5%. Yet we still have ambitious targets and we have a, a, approximately 50 nations submitting their national uh, determined contributions as our panelist uh, Tuti has also alluded to. And um, these uh, national determined uh, commitments, but also um, national plans, um, they, need to, um, also, they need to be financed. Um, so there is a need uh, for financial technology and also capacity support. Um, and these need to come from our various donors. And also during the summary presentation by Professor Frank, he also um, presented the graph where you could see the gap um, in terms of financing for mitigation. Uh, so this is one of the areas that we would need uh, to address in order for this uh, to be met. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Yvette, um, colleagues. Um, that was the last question uh, based on the um, time we've set for this webinar. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will coordinate all the uh, responses to the rest of the questions they weren't asked today. Um, so uh, rest assured, we will be in touch with the answers to the rest of the questions in our Q&A chat box. Um, we are now moving to the, um, the closing session. And uh, again, I would like to acknowledge the Director General of SPREP, um, Mr. Sefanaya, who is still here with us um, to say a few words of uh, closing remarks uh, to our uh, meeting today. Thank you, Sef. Thank you, Ofa. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Frank uh, initially for a very clear presentation of the report. Um, I think it really helped us to take in uh, bite-sized uh, chunks. What is I'm sh sure very detailed and very exhaustive information if you try and uh, absorb it uh, in one go. Uh, I found it very useful and very um, uh, good in the way that you expressed some of the very, um, not only what you could see as complicated, but some of the sensitivities around some of the issues that uh, you raised. Um, I think there's always the interconnectedness between uh, science, policy, and politics. Uh, they all have the different roles to play in this uh, very important issue for all of us. Uh, but we need to plug away at the areas that we are responsible for and make sure that we exchange information uh, on things that are outside our ambit of influence um, so that those who are functioning in those areas can make informed uh, decision based on what our findings are as uh, scientists or as technical people. Um, it's a very important thing um, and that's where the approach, I think, in the Pacific uh, is useful. Um, this uh, whole idea of dialogue of Talanoa, so that we don't just become polarized because we have different positions, but we try and appreciate what uh, what's driving that position. 
uh, that uh, perspective that you raised on the state and federal uh, politics within uh, uh, understanding what the overall Australian position is. So it's uh, it's taking the time to really sit down with our uh, partners and members or regional uh, neighbours that uh, is really important in this kind of uh, uh, often politically uh, high octane type discussion that often happens uh, in the climate change area. Um, I was just reflecting uh, on how far climate change has come in the region. Um, I was one of the first uh, Pacific Island uh, people involved in climate change. Uh, in the early 1990s, even before the UN convention. And when I went to go to the INCs, uh, I went to Fiji Foreign Affairs and asked them, okay, what's my brief as uh, the technical person going? And I was told, uh, oh, you make it up as you you get there. That, that was the situation. Um, and then uh, I go to COP26. I attended the um, a meeting in Suva, and uh, all of the climate change, or all of the ministerial heads were were there, contributing to a position by Fiji. Um, I'm sure it's the same situation in all countries. So it's a it's a big uh, leap forward um, in how we address climate change in the region. It's no longer just the environment departments; it's everyone who's addressing it. Um, I, I say that to try and put into context because sometimes we are uh, impatient with the level of change, the level of action on things like uh, climate security, on action on different things. But uh, we need to take stock of where we are now and where we started from uh, to keep the momentum going forward. Um, in saying that, I just want to encourage all of us to keep on doing our, our roles especially those of you who are scientists or those who help the policymakers do things um, so that we can uh, help each other to do what we need to. And from our side, uh, I think I just pledge that we will continue to play the role that SPREP needs to play, both as PREP and as the Pacific uh, Climate Change Center. Thank you. Inaka Wakalevu, um, Director General, um, thank you for those uh, final thoughts and remarks. Um, and thank you again, uh, our distinguished panelists for uh, today, as well as acknowledging our participants from around the Pacific and our friends from abroad. Thank you very much for staying the course with us um, and joining this webinar. I uh, will now to bring the webinar into a close and I would like to invite again, my colleague Sione Fulivai to please see, say the closing grace for uh, the meeting. Thank you. Aloha bito. Colleagues, if we get up, bow our heads and prayer again. Heavenly Father, as our meeting and as the day comes to a close, we again give thanks and praise to you for your guidance and for having your hand upon us throughout this process. We thank you, Lord, for the strength and courage that you have bestowed upon us and the blessings that you have given us throughout today and throughout the days to come to ensure that we move forward in the knowledge, knowing that we share amongst each other as colleagues, as brethren, and as family, knowledge and information that we need to persevere and to strengthen ourselves moving forward as a people, as a region, and as a global community in this fight against climate change. And we ask these things in the name of your son, our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hello, and I would now bring the webinar to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, Pasha. Bye, Solomone. Bye, Bye, Bye. 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 See you guys Pasha. soon. Yeah.